My family was pretty funny. You know, my, my grandfather, my mother's father, who passed many years ago, was a real character and a cut up. And I learned a lot from him, but the thing that really kind of jump started for me was my dad had a fruit and vegetable store in Forest Hills, Queens. And in the mid 70s, a customer gave him front row tickets to see Don Rickles at Westbury Music Fair on Long Island. And he called my mom up and said, Roe, I have tickets to see Rickles. And she said, I'm not going to see Rickles and sitting in the front row. So my dad took me. So my dad and I sit in the front row seat and front row seats and uh, the band starts to play. Rickles comes out, he goes to his act, he turns, he sees me, he sees my father, and he stops everything and says to my father, what'd you take this kid here for, you stupid hockey puck? He's gonna piss his pants, you're gonna have to take him home. What'd you do, tell him it's Disney World? And he kind of winked and came over and shook my hand. You know, it was interesting because I remember when I shook his hand, his skin was really soft. And my dad was a blue collar guy, you know, all my, they all had like rough hands. Yeah. And I thought, that's interesting, you know? And he kind of winked and shook my dad's hand. And I was like, that was it, I was hooked. Our lives are often filled with worry and chaos as the media propagates one negative story after another, bringing divide and tension within topics such as politics, religion, and race relations. These stories fuel hatred and confusion while people continue to live in fear. Yet through all this negative energy, many are delivering messages of wisdom and hope, encouraging positive change, and that's something I'm aiming to do. My name is Roger Brooks, and I'm hopeful for our future, but we must be the change and not be a spectator in life, looking from the outside in. For as long as I could remember, I've been fascinated by people's stories. Stories speak to us, and since the beginning of time, the human race has prospered by passing down wisdom told through the essence of story. It's a way for people to aspire to become the hero they know they could be, seeing their higher self through the wisdom of others. What started out as a hobby has quickly turned into my life mission. And as I deliver a new guest each Sunday, I'll aim to prompt the questions you may be thinking. And through the power of listening, I'll allow the guest to speak and articulate their points of view in order to give you the headspace you need to realize your own hero's journey. We are one race. We are one people. Help spread the word about American Real. And together, let's make great stories go viral to inspire, enlighten, and empower those we love and the masses we hope to reach. On this week's show, American Reel sets up our studio in what Chris Mazzilli calls his living room, better known as the Gotham Comedy Club, located in the heart of New York City. The visionary and co-founder sits down for an in-depth conversation, bringing us back to his childhood, where it all began when his father took him to see the legendary Don Rickles for his first comedy show, which he admits is in part the reason the club exists. From Jerry Seinfeld, Amy Schumer, Dave Chappelle, and Louis Black, the Gotham is a New York City favorite for laughter. Chris discusses the relationships he's built over the years some of the most famous comedians in history, like the late David Brenner and Robin Williams, as well as having a small part in supporting more recent up-and-coming success stars like Sebastian Maniscalco. 
So sit back, relax, as I welcome Chris Mazzilli. This is American Real. I am Roger Brooks. My guest today is Chris Mazzilli, a graduate of the Fashion Institute of Technology. You founded Gotham Comedy Club in New York City in 1996, where you've proven to yourself to be a leader in the industry, bringing in comics such as Dave Chappelle, Louis Black, and Colin Quinn, who helped really build this place up. Gotham Comedy Club is where we are filming this episode today, uh, and it's been the backdrop for many TV shows and films, including Jerry Seinfeld's 2002 Miramax film, Comedian, and Larry David's pilot of Curb Your Enthusiasm. Chris, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, I appreciate it. Well, thanks for having us here uh, to be able to set up our studio in your theater. It's in my just, living room. <laughs> it's, this is your living room. How fun is that? And tonight, this place will be a whole different atmosphere, right? Yeah, it's uh, all the shows are sold out tonight. It's just uh, there's a special feel, vibe when it's like that. And now you've been doing this for a couple of decades, right? Uh, <laughs> Overall, 30 years, and uh, this club's been open 23 now. Awesome. Yeah. And weekends like this, where it's sold out, I mean, th does do you ever get over the thrill, or no. does it just keep building? No, I, I, you know what? It's even coming down today. It's like I was kind of running down the stairs to my garage to get my car and drive down here. I just, I love it, and I, it never gets old. You know, it's a, uh, it's a special place that we created here. And what is it that attracted you to comedy early on? My family was pretty funny. You know, my my grandfather, my mother's father, who passed many years ago was a real character and a cut up. And I learned a lot from him, but the thing that really kind of jump started it for me was my dad had a fruit and vegetable store in Forest Hills, Queens. And in the mid seventies, a customer gave him front row tickets to see Don Rickles at West Bear Music Fair on Long Island. And he called my mom up and said, Ro, I have tickets to see Rickles. And she said, I'm not going to see Rickles and sitting in the front row. So my dad took me. How so old were you? 12. So my dad and I sit in the front row seat and front row seats and uh, the band starts to play. Rickles comes out. He goes into his act. He turns. He sees me. He sees my father. And he stops everything and says to my father, what did you take this kid here for, you stupid hockey puck? He's going to piss his pants. You're going to have to take him home. What would you do, tell him it's Disney World? And he kind of winked and came over and shook my hand. You know, and it was interesting because I remember when I shook his hand, his skin was really soft. And my dad was a blue collar guy, you know, all my, they all had like rough hands. Yeah. And I thought, that's interesting, you know? And he kind of winked and shook my dad's hand. And I was like, that was it, I was hooked. So then I was allowed to stay up late and watch all the comedians on The Tonight Show. So that started my love with comedy. So really, Rickles is in part the reason why this club exists. Unbelievable. Did you ever see him or meet him after I did. that? I did, my, uh, my brother Steve, who's my partner here in the club, um, and I went to the Montreal Comedy Festival a couple of years ago, and he was there, and I told him the story. You know, I mean, obviously loved in memory, it. But, sure. but he dug it, yeah. you know, and he was, he was a nice man. Yeah. So we'll definitely get to talking about this place and, and all you've done here over the years, but I'd love to hear the backstory of you. You talked a little bit about your upbringing with your dad, but what was life growing up for you? Um, you know what? I was always a a creative guy. Um, you know, my parents were very influential. They were good parents. You know, I, I think I, I, I'm a good combination of their best assets. You know, uh, hardworking, drive. My mom's creative, uh, so I was creative. You know, but I kind of had a split. I think most people kind of fall into the kind of like the business analytic category or the creative category. I'm kind of split down the middle. I have a little of both, and I think it works well in this business. So, you know, I grew up, I was born in Queens, raised in Long Island. I was into sports, uh, early on into cars. My dad, uh, for a stint, worked for Chevrolet, uh, a couple different dealers, and he was a street racer. So I grew up hearing these crazy stories about him drag racing on Francis Lewis Boulevard in Queens. He had a 58 Bel Air with a 348 Tri-Power, three-speed on the column, and a 355 Posi. So I heard all these stories, and, and I became hooked very, very early on, as did my brothers, and, and we were into cars. 
Um, so it's like, you know, I, I had a pretty normal childhood, you know. I played sports, uh, excelled at soccer, although I blew my knees out uh, my junior year in high school. Um, tight with my brothers, I have a sister, you know, we're still you know, really close clan, tight these days. A lot of cousins, 45 first cousins. And, you know, my dad, as I mentioned, was in the uh, fruit and vegetable store business and eventually supermarkets, and I worked alongside of him since I was like eight. You know, um, and I liked it. You know, it was like a special thing to to be able to go to work with my dad. I mean, we had to get up early, especially when he had stores in Queens. You know, get up like five o'clock in the morning, be on the road. You know, early five thirty, get there by seven, and work like a twelve-hour day, and then come back. It was a lot but for a little kid, sure. Yeah, but I dug it. It was fun. You know, and I think it gives me the drive I have today to do this. I was just going to say that work ethic even though there were probably some days, even though you, you said you liked it, there were probably some days you didn't want to go or didn't want to get up early. Maybe not. You know, yeah, I mean, you know, there were ups and downs with the family. And my dad eventually had a store not too far from where I grew up in Northport, Long Island. Uh, and it was, you know, it was tough. It's a hard business. You know, I mean, that's why it's like I, I perishables are difficult. You know, what I like about this business is if I don't sort of sell a Budweiser today, I could sell it tomorrow or next week or two weeks from now. It's not going to go bad. When you're dealing with romaine lettuce, you know, or any kind of vegetable. Watermelons. Or, yeah, yeah. You know, all that stuff is perishable. You know, same thing with meat. So it's, it's, a, it's a really, it's a hard business, you know. And that, and that, that business started very, very early in the morning. Because like, literally I can remember being in my, in my family's household and my dad's buyer from the produce market would call 3, 4 o'clock in the morning, you know, and ask my, and you, could, you know, I mean, back then you, there was no cell phone, so the phone rang throughout the whole house, you, you sure. know. Um, so it was, you know, it was difficult. Did you know that you didn't want to be in that business? Yes. You know, my dad didn't want to be in that business either. He really, he preferred to be in the car business. But his dad became ill, and he went to the family business. His father died 54 years old of heart, fa of heart failure. Yeah. You know, and uh, my dad, listen, God bless him. He worked hard. He still works hard. He's almost he's 79 now. Um, he didn't want to do it. And he gave me some good advice. He said, you know, son, figure out what you love to do and then find a way to make money at it. And it always stuck with me. You know, so, it, you know, I mean, I didn't land here first. You know, I, my career path kind of took a couple different changes because initially I wanted to be an attorney. Uh, I wanted to go to Columbia and I... And I played soccer, so I was going to go on a partial soccer scholarship, but I blew my knees out and did my soccer career then. Uh, so a backup school was FIT, and I had always liked design. So I went to FIT, you know, so it was a change in my career path. Um, I did menswear design there, graduated, had a job for like one month, didn't like it, decided I wanted to go to acting school, and I literally called my parents and said, Mom, Dad, I'm quitting my job. And I want to go to acting school. I figured I'm 20 years old. I'm living in Manhattan. And to their credit, they said, you know what, son? We believe in you. We try Go for it. You know, you can do whatever you want to do. And, and they kind of raised us that way. And I think, you know, my siblings and I all kind of believe that, you know, that we could do anything. It's so important. It is. It's, it, 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 it's key. You know, so I did go to acting school. I got lucky. I got an agent early on. You know, I did a couple of Law and Orders, a couple of the New York TV shows. There used to be a show called New York on the Cover. You know, did some theater stuff. Uh, and from there, I started doing stand-up. I was kind of frustrated that I wasn't working as enough, enough as an actor. Uh, and I did an open mic. There was a place used to be on 14th Street called the Eagle Tavern. Okay. And uh, like August 1990, I did my first open mic. And I liked it. It was fun, you know. And it was, you know, like I would always tell funny stories as a kid, and I was kind of goofy. You know, I acted like in some high school stuff, did silly things like, you know, reenactments of uh, Cheech and Chong with my, uh, my buddy Lou Benora, who I'm still friends with today. Um, and, you know, it just, it, it felt good. And then I started going around to the clubs, started working as a comedian, and I enjoyed it, um, but I kind of... I felt that a lot of them were kind of run down and dirty. And the bigger issue was I didn't feel they treated the, cust the customers well or the comedians well. So I was like, hey, you know, there's a need for a different comedy club. And at that time, 
I met this other young comedian, a guy named uh, Michael Reisman, who was a Wall Street guy uh, and doing stand-up. And we just started chatting, you know, chatting about comedy and the business. And uh, I was running another club in the city at night and doing stand-up. And he was kind of like, you know, maybe we should do something. I said, look, I said, I agree. Maybe the time's not right now, but we should start talking about it. And we did. And we had a couple of good ideas and started seriously talking about it like in 94. And then uh, really kind of hatched the plan. And I'll never forget, I sketched out, started thinking of different names. It was almost Hollywood Comedy Club, but it just it kind of felt uh, cheesy. And I love architecture in old New York. So Gotham just seemed like the right name because it's an old New York name. The original Gothamites from England were known as wise fools because somewhere hundreds of years ago, the king wanted to take over their town and the Gothamites got word. They knew they couldn't fight the king's army. So what they said is they knew that the king was gonna send men to kind of scope the town out and they all acted nuts when these guys showed up. So those guys wrote back to the king and said, listen, we're not taking that town. All these people are freaking crazy. So <laughs> that's, that's why, that's how we got the Gotham name. Wow. And, uh, you know, we opened the club May 10th, 1996. Uh, opening night was, was a magical night. I'll never forget it. Uh, a guy named Mike Royce was the MC, And, you know, Mike was a great comedian. He went on to be an executive producer of Everybody Loves Raymond, among other shows. Um, Paul Provenza, who's had great success, uh, Sarah Silverman, who was, you know, wow. huge, and Dave Chappelle. That was our opening night. Incredible. You know, and it was, I remember we paid Chappelle, he was the headliner, we paid him a thousand bucks. Wow. Which was a lot back yeah, then. Yeah, it was a sure. lot of wood. Sure. You know, and the kind of philosophy was we wanted to open a club where comedians were treated better than they ever were or anywhere else. Same thing for the customers. And the club was like a classy club where you could take a date or invite your parents, you know, just something different than what existed out there. And I remember opening night, sitting there and talking to my partner at the time uh, and saying, we're either going to hit it really big or this thing's going to fail miserably, <laughs> you know. It really depends on what people want and, you know, are they ready for a club like this? And it was great because, you know, I know in my intro you mentioned Colin and I've known Colin for years and he's been a, a dear friend, just a good, good guy. But like I would meet with him and kind of go to the construction of the club and we try to figure out how high the stage should be, you know, and he would be standing on a milk crate, you know, and what feels right, you know. And I literally walked around with a notebook for two years and everybody that would talk to me, I'd ask them questions like, do you go to comedy clubs, you know, if so, how, and the interesting thing, two things stood out in those interviews that people always would tell me, oh, I love comedy. And I go, oh, how often do you go? Oh, like once every year, once every two years. And it's like, they just, people didn't go, mm -hmm. you know? And it's like, and I could never get an answer, why not? And the other thing is most women said, I like comedy clubs, but the bathrooms are disgusting. So I was like, all right, we have to have nice bathrooms, you know? So I literally carried around this notebook for two years, took every single note, and then, you know, we started to design and build Gotham. And, you know, because I had a design background, I, I designed the club. That's you awesome. know, I knew what colors I wanted, you know? And, the, and this is our second space, the original space, was on 22nd Street. It was in a building that was built in 1898. Um, so I wanted the logo to kind of look like old New York and, and in the build out of the club, we used like a lot of dark wood. And it kind of almost felt like more of an old pub or a, you know, a gentleman's club. Mm -hmm. uh, and when we opened, people thought we had been open for a while. It just kind of felt like it was around longer than it had been. Um, and it was, you know, it was an interesting time. And I was young, I was 31 years old. Wow. And it was tough, you know, in the beginning it was hard. Um, I didn't take a salary for the first year, year and change, you know, and even then like, and I was working 90, 100 hours a week doing everything. Uh, but- It was your passion. Again, you, I, you know, that's the whole thing. I believed in what we were doing. Uh, I think if people were attending the club and they didn't like what we were doing, I may have rethought it, but people liked the product we were putting out. The comedians liked what we were doing. And we were lucky because like a lot of guys like, who are big now, Jim Gaffigan started there. You know, um, Greg Giraldo, who unfortunately is no longer with us. You know, Tom Papa, these guys all kind of were there in the beginning. And, uh, and then I, I, you know, I, I caught a break. What happened was 
David Brenner, the comedian, was my dear friend that like, you know, he passed a few years ago. I miss him terribly. Great guy. He came in just randomly and he really liked the club and he started coming a lot. And then he told Robin Williams and I'll never forget the first time he came. I was down in my office because my office was below the main floor of the club and uh, the host buzzed up. She's like, there's some old guy with a hat up here to see you, you know, and like, I'll take a meeting with anybody, you know. So I said, all right. Tell him I'll be right up. And I come up there and I realized it's Robin Williams. Wow. You know? So he said to me, you know, oh, I'm friends with David Brenner and he told me to come by and see the club and it's a great club and, you know, I'd really love to work here. Do you think I'd be okay? And I'm thinking, do I think that'd be okay? Uh, yeah, I think I'd be fine, you know? So he actually went on that night and no it was kidding. unbelievable. This was at the first location? Yeah, that okay. was the first location. And, uh, and then he started coming, you know? And then when Seinfeld started to rap, um, and that's, that's just an interesting story in itself. When we first opened, we would employ comedians from time to time. So we had this comedian uh, answering phones for us. Her name was Jody Wasserman. She's still a dear friend today, and she still, still does stand up. And she's kind of like a tough girl. I used to call her Alley Cat. That was my, two, I had two nicknames for her, Prom Queen and Alley Cat. <laughs> and uh, I walked in one day, and this is before, you know, there were like those voicemail systems. So she used to take physical notes and say, this is who called for you. So I walk in, I said, who called? She's like, oh, this, this. She goes, oh, yeah, and some stupid comic claiming to be Jerry Seinfeld said he wanted to come in. I'm like, well, what did he say exactly? She goes, ah, you know, he asked what show was going on. He said it was Jerry Seinfeld, and could he come in and do time tonight? And I said, well, how do you know it wasn't him? She goes, come on. She goes, it definitely wasn't him. I go, what would you do? She goes, I hung up on him. I was like, all right. So I went down to my office, I'm like, well, what if it really is him, you know? So I called Colin Quinn, and you know, him and Jerry have been tight for years, and I said, Colin, I said, do me a favor. I said, can you call Seinfeld to see if he called the club? I said, I don't, it may not have been him, the host said it's up, but just in case, just in case, you know? It was a Tuesday night, I'll never forget it. So he calls me right back, he goes, it's him, and he's coming, and I went. So I walked upstairs and said, hey, Jody. I go, that wasn't Jerry Seinfeld? I go, it was. She's like, what? What? Oh, my God. Oh, my God. My career's over. I said, no, nah, it was an honest mistake. And he came in that night, you know, and he, he dug the club, and then he started coming. So it was, it was good. Like, those things happening, you know, and there were mentions, like, in page six, and there were some newspaper articles that kind of launched who we were and what we did. Um, and then, you know, we had a... We had a good run there, you know, a few of the other things that happened. We um, there used to be a, a station, a television station network called Metro Channel, mm -hmm. and we wound up doing a, a comedy series with them, uh, with Robert Klein hosting, and it kind of took us to another level. Um, made the club busier, kind of gave us a little notoriety. It was kind of neat to have our own series. And we started to outgrow the space. And not too soon after that, I opened, uh, with a few friends of my partner, uh, a restaurant right down the street from the club called Arezzo, A-R-E-Z-Z-O. And we had a soft opening in July of 2001. Okay. And we officially opened in August, and then 9-11 happened. Ooh. And it was, it was rough. The worst time to open a restaurant. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was I mean, look, you know, I saw all that stuff happen. It was, it was awful, you know, it was a terrible time in American history, it was a terrible time in New York especially, and terrible for business. Um, so, you know, it, it was a rough go, and I, you know, I learned a lot um, with that restaurant. We eventually sold it, and that guy had a good run, and the guy after that that he sold it to had a good run. Um, but the broker, and the reason why I mentioned the restaurant, the broker who sold the restaurant said to me, hey Chris, I know you're doing well, at Gotham, would you ever consider opening a second comedy club or moving Gotham? So I said, yeah. So he's like, there's a space that's not even available on 23rd Street. Why don't you come take a look? And I came in with him through the building and walked in this room. I took one look. I said, I'll take it. He said, well, you didn't see I said, I can tell you right now, I'll take it. Put me in contact with the landlord. Now, what's interesting is, you know, most of the time when a landlord has a tenant, you know, who's got a proven track record, because at that time we were already open nine years, it's a layup. Right. Not here, because they had had different nightclubs that were not successful, not successful in a way that they lied about what they were going to be. They were playing, 
loud music till all hours of the night. There were shootings, there were stabbings. They were very, very gun shy about having any kind of nightclub related thing. And the reality is, I could have said I was opening a comedy club and just opened another nightclub. So they, they had their building manager come to see multiple shows at the old club. Wow. You know, the landlord came, you know, and then finally, when they got comfortable, they said, okay, we'll, you know, we'll lease you the space. And they're fantastic people. I mean, they've become great friends. Um, you know, we have a great uh, tenant landlord relationship. And what year was that when you moved in? That was uh, 2004-ish, okay. you know, uh, and it was great because at that time we were growing in leaps and bounds, but it was hard because I was kind of a one-man guy. Uh, my younger brother, Steve, who came from the accounting financial world, uh, was looking to make a change in his career, so he came on and joined me as a partner, and then it was really great because with the two of us, we could really do a lot and kind of grow the business together, you know, and it's... You know, we get along really well. I mean, th the fact that we work together five, sometimes six days a, a week and get along as well as we do, it says a lot That's about, right. yeah. you know, our relationship, you know. And it's good. We really, we work well together. We complement each other. And, you know, we're able to grow this this really cool business. That's awesome. So yeah. my one question that's burning in my mind is when did you stop doing the stand-up and why? So once I opened the club, you know, I, uh, I made a very conscious decision that my goal, and it's still my goal for this club, for it to be the best comedy club in the country. That's it. And I wanted the club to be taken seriously. So how was I going to, you know, do stand up and be take, you know, and run a club? It, just, it, it wasn't going to work. So very early on in like, you know, 96, once the club was open, I stopped. Okay. That was it. And, you know, it's interesting because people say to me, do you regret your decision? I really don't. I mean, I, I'm blessed in, in that I love what I do. You know, I never get tired of coming here, ever, you know. Uh, and it was the right decision. Do you liken the decision to back in your sports days where, you know, you had to give up soccer, but say, say that didn't happen and you kept going with, with, with sports, at some point a lot of us have to make the decision that, okay, I, you know, I can't do this for a living, I enjoy it, mm. I need to focus my energy somewhere else. Yeah, well, I mean, I also didn't want to be jack of all trades and master of none, you yeah. know, but I just, I knew to grow a business, to make it different, to make it special, it needs attention, it's like a baby, you know, so I just, yeah, I had like laser folks, I put all my effort into this club, you know, and even like the staff, like the hiring, it's so key. Um, you know, and even today, like my managers that do the hiring here, we talk about it all the time. Like I tell them, take your time, hire, you know, the right people. I don't care if you have to interview 100 people, find the right one, train them the right way. You know, this way they're here for a while and we treat them very well. You know, we're a good unit. It's so important to be successful. No, this place is, is gorgeous. Um, you know, I've been to a lot of comedy clubs. Oh, thanks. I appreciate uh, nothing that. Nothing like this, of course. And I've actually been here, mm. uh, my wife and I and, and a few friends, to see Sebastian Maniscalco. And in my <laughs> opinion, one of the best to ever, ever the do best. it. I mean, he's, uh, I met, my brother and I met him up in Montreal about seven, eight years ago. And um, booked him to do a weekend here at the club. And... Uh, he was fantastic. I stood back in the back of the room and watched him on a Friday night. Called my brother and said, "You got to come down and see this guy. We need to work with him, you know, because he's he's unbelievable." Yeah, you know, um, he's special. He really is special, and I, it's a guy like that. I, 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 you know, we've been listening to him now for several years, but there's still a lot of people that that don't know who he is. Well, um, you know that that it's it's amazing that he has all the success, you know, but he's still relatively unknown. Well. You know what? You hit the nail on the head. It is amazing because even here, which is his biggest market, I talk to people and they have no clue who he is. Meantime, coming up in January, he sold out four shows at Madison Square Garden. Yeah. And, you know, not the small the theater, Madison Square Garden proper, right. which it's unheard of. He's drawing people from all over, from Connecticut, Jersey, Pennsylvania. Yep. yep. It's unbelievable. Yep. And I, I, I feel we have a lot to see from him you know, in the future, whether it's yeah. movies, television, yep. whatnot. He's incredible. Yeah, I agree. 
I agree. It's one of the fun things you know, of this business, kind of watching people. You know, like we discovered Amy Schumer as well. And uh, I remember seeing her at the old club, and it's like there was something special there early on. And I told her, I said, look, I said, you have something different. You have something special. And we were fortunate. We had, you know, run with her where we managed her for a while. And, you know, she's a good kid, you know, and, and has a huge career now. So in this type of business, um, it, how difficult is it to attract good talent? And how frequent are you putting out shows? Well, I think we've been doing it long enough now, and people know that we run a good room. You know, and it's like the little things, like uh, we call them floor managers, but the guys who kind of run this room at night, they police the room. So if people misbehave or, you know, they're drunk, th they'll talk to them and say, listen, we, we want you to stay, but you can't interrupt the show like that. You know, a lot of clubs let that go. We don't. You know, because it's, if it's disruptive to the other 250 or 300 people in the room, that's not good for anybody, you know, and comics appreciate that. So we've built a good room and really kind of thinking, not to sound cheesy, but if you build it, they will come. And they did. And they still do. So there's no shortage of comedians that want to work the room. I mean, listen, we're open seven nights a week between the room that we're sitting in right now and the lounge we do shows, you know. We'll do, you know, 25 shows a week, 23 shows a week. You know, so we're it's seven nights, you know, sometimes three. Like tonight we have four shows. Tomorrow we have six shows. Um, and what do you do if a comedian gets sick or they have to cancel? I mean, do you have people on the house? Is it, yeah, is it I mean, rare that it happens? Yeah, I mean, there's always somebody to fill in, unless it's a really, really big name. But it's like that's it's very, very rare. It's very rare that somebody is too sick to perform, you know, because the reality is if you're headlining, you got to do an hour, you right. know. Have you ever had to call Colin for an emergency? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Tell us about it. Yeah, there was, uh, there was an issue with the comic one night, and uh, I did call. It's funny you mentioned his name, because he was the guy I called. You know, I, there was time, I called him one time. I called Gaffigan another time. Uh, and they came in and filled in. Wow. Yeah. That's a good friend. Oh, yeah. Good people. I, it, it's, there is like a brotherhood. Of, you know, there's really solid people. I mean, listen, again, I love this business. I feel blessed to be in it. So when you were growing up, we're, you're a couple years older than me, but um, who were the guys you like? I know you watched Late Night, but did you like the Eddie Murphys? Did oh, you like Murphy, the Chris Rock? Yeah, yeah I mean, great. <laughs> they, Rock, fantastic. Like I said, I mean, even like some of the older guys, like, you know, Rickles. I mean, you know, Seinfeld is a master craftsman, you know. Um, I always loved Colin. You know, I, I think he's brilliant, you know. Even like some of the like, I, I used to find Buddy Hackett really funny. You know, I thought it was an entertaining guy. Yeah, there was a lot. And it seems that, at least my perspective on comedy, is that it, it has trends where it's really popular and then it just kind of goes under the radar. Is that the same from your perspective or does it stay pretty steady from No, you know what I mean? I, I, think, I think you're right. There are peaks and valleys. I think it's, it, it's hot right now. And I think because people have access with the internet and yeah. it's, it's, it's just, it's out there, you know? And, with these handheld devices, you could, it's, you know, it's accessible 24-7. And the Sebastians of the world are able to get on there on Instagram or Facebook every day yep. and keep, yep. keep their fans updated. So, That's right. Yeah. Exactly right. That's so awesome. And that medium has really changed the business. How the people reach their customers, you know, it's, it's a big deal. And I'm sure it helps business as yes. well. Yeah. Yeah. No question about it. So the world out there now. That's right. There was a, a release, a press release in the summertime that you did a deal with the Borgata. So our relationship uh, through bringing people like Sebastian to Borgata, we got to know the people in the entertainment uh, department there. And they're fantastic people. And they have a theater there called the Music Box Theater. It's a thousand seat room. And um, they were looking to make a change there and they wind up hiring my brother and I to book that. So in addition to everything you're doing here, you're booking that, that as well. And yep. What's, what's the demand like there as far uh, as your time? You know what? I mean, my brother kind of runs the day-to-day -day with that now, and he's doing a fantastic job with that. Um, but it's, it, it's a big time commitment because a lot of times it's five to seven shows a week that we're booking, you know, in that theater. Um, 
multiple names, and it's a very specific thing. Uh, so there's a lot of coordinating that goes on with it, but you know, they seem to be happy with the shows, the shows are selling well, and it's a, it's a fantastic venue. I mean, that property, oh, it's, it's, it's fantastic, I mean, it's beautiful. You know, it's a billion dollar property, you know, and they really, they get comedy there, they understand it, they treat their customers fantastic, they treat the comedians great, I mean, it's, they're, they're, they're terrific people. We really love them. Customer service is so important, right? It's paramount. You, and, and from the standpoint of you have a big room to service, you have your comedians to service. How did, I, I can't think, help but think back to your days with your dad. Do you think any of that played into? 100%. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't think, I know. You know, my dad was the type of guy that he himself would carry packages out to the customer's cars. You know, if there was a customer that wanted a particular grocery item that we didn't cover, carry, if we were going to sell one just to that, he would get it. And the thinking would be, I want them to come here and do all their shopping, so I'll get this one item for them, even if I'm not going to sell it, just for them. You know, uh, it was all about customer service and the presentation. I, I, you know, if I could think of how many times my father told me to get a mop here or get a mop there, you know, or my, and it was interesting because at that time, my, my dad had this particular store. I was in high school, so all my friends worked there, like 12 of us, <laughs> you know. We still tell stories about, the store was called the Apple Orchard, about the orchard today. I mean, we laugh our asses off. It's, it's a great, great time. It's and great. even those guys, like, I'm lucky. Like, my high school, my crew of high school friends, there's about 12 of us that get together every quarter for a dinner. Wow. You know, and they're great. And most of them worked at my dad's store. It's so awesome. Rare today yeah. to, to have that. Yeah, so I mean, it definitely, no question about it, what we do here and how we treat our customers and the comedians comes directly from my father, without doubt. Chris, uh, for young entrepreneurs out there that have an interest in comedy and want to open up a club in their market, what advice would you have for them? Because it's not easy. No, no. I mean, it, it's really... I think you have to have a clear, concise vision, you know, of what that club's going to be. And, you know, you got to research the market, too. What's out? Are there other clubs out there, you know, in that particular market? Are there enough people to populate that comedy club? You know, I mean, it's a brick-and-mortar business. It's hard. It's a lot of time, a lot of work, you know, but it can be done. You know, you got to be willing to put the time and effort. Uh, can't be undercapitalized. I mean, that's the key. The, 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 you know, one of the main things that kills a new business is undercapitalized. Undercapital, yeah, and I, I'm, you know, I'm from upstate New York mm -hmm. in, in Binghamton. It's a small market, and, and comedy's been around, but sporadically. It's, it's tough in those small markets to, to make it. Um, I actually, maybe about 15 years ago, um, was involved with a small group that were bringing some comedians through, and I, and I mm -hmm. know how difficult it is. Um, well, and the other thing is, you know, if you don't know what the going market is for a comic, I mean, you can get ripped off. You know, because like a lot of times, and it's, a lot of times it's not their direct agent, they're a middleman. People like, like you go online and say, I want to hire a comedian, and an agency pops up, and they say, we can get you all these guys. But they don't represent those guys. They're middlemen. They go to the agent that actually represents them. So let's say a comic, you know, his going rate to do weekend is $10,000. This middleman gets involved. He's taking a piece off the top, so he's charging you $20,000. So yeah. you're paying $10,000 extra. $10,000 is going in this guy's pocket, and $10,000 is going to the comedian. And you think, okay, this guy's going to sell a lot of tickets, because that, you know, but you get ripped off. Mm -hmm. And that happens a lot. And like anything, it's just really getting to know the business and... Yep. being in it every day. Well, that's the whole thing. It's like, I was a comedian. I ran another club, you know, so I had a lot, and I had a business experience with my dad, so I had a lot going into it, you know. And even then, I took that, that notebook for two years and went around and talked to people about what was important to them. And I'm telling you, a lot of the stuff that's in this club today is from that notebook. Wow. You know, a lot of things that we did, a lot of what our menu was like. So, point being, do your research. Spend your time to... Absolutely. Yeah. There's no, like, I think... Another thing people do is they'll rush into doing it. Take your time. It's, it's key. Like you said, it took two years, right? When you yeah. Be, by the time you... Oh, yeah. I yeah, I mean, we, we sat down and started seriously talking about it in 94, and the club didn't open until May of 96. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I'd like to talk about you 
uh, and your personality a little bit. I reached out to, I don't know, three or four months ago. Um, I was looking for a venue to host an interview. And for some reason, my, on the map, I just noticed and I, and I called and I reached out and you said, sure, you could, you could use our place. That's rare. So it shouldn't be. I'm just, well, in New York, it's rare because I called a lot of places and no one wanted anything to do with us, right? So my point is your upbringing, your, your dad, the customer service, all this stuff plays into you coming up the stairs to, to see who that was. And it was Robin Williams, making sure you called Colin Quinn to see if that was Jerry Seinfeld. You care. I do. Very much so. Can you teach people that? I think so. I, I think if they're open to it, you know, look, in life, sometimes people are closed-minded, so that, that's a, a hard battle. But you could definitely teach it, you know, because we teach it with our staff. If they make a mistake, learn from it. Yeah. Don't do it again. You know, but also give people the benefit. Just be nice. It's a simple little thing. How many times you call a place to make a reservation or you know, deal with somebody in a retail situation where they're not nice? It's unbelievable. Like what you just said, I've heard this story 50 times, 100 times from other places that have called here to shoot, whether it be a big movie, a TV show. We just shot something last week and they said, oh wow, you guys are so nice. Why shouldn't we be nice? Why should, you know, it's like you're paying us to, to shoot here. You know, it's like, but people are not nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it, our mission on this show is to not only tell people's stories, but, you know, just to raise that level of global consciousness that we, we do need to be nicer as people. I mean, the, the little things matter. And um, you're preaching to the choir. I mean, yeah. I, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm nice to everybody. I, I really mean it. Unless they're not nice to me, I'm nice to everybody. Talk about that. How do you connect that? with success because you hear a lot of these people you know you have to be you know a tough guy you can't you have to steamroll people that's you know? BS I'll tell you right now and you could talk to any employee that works here I'm nice to all of them you know and it's not that I, I can't discipline somebody or but like I said earlier the philosophy is take your time hire the right people train them the right way and then let them do their job and if they don't do their job then you pull them aside and say hey listen you got to you know because I don't I'm going to tell you, in 23 years of doing this, I may have raised my voice once or twice. That's it. That's it. Well, you know, I don't lose my cool. I just don't. And we have a good staff here. You know, people get it. They understand, you know. Um, you know, like a lot of times if I'm in a restaurant or some kind of retail shop and I see a manager yelling at somebody, my first thought is this person wasn't training the right way. Coming down hard, so if you're doing something this or doing that, it's like, it should never get to that point. Not only that, it's like, you're doing that in front of the customer? Right. You're, you're showing that in front of the customer? That's a big mistake, because nobody wants to be in that situation. And they, nor should they be. You know, so I don't think you have to rule with an iron fist. And it's worked pretty well for you. Yeah. No, it's been a good run. Let's shift gears a little bit, because I know you're on a tight time schedule today. Um, you talked about your car family, your dad, your brothers. True. And you have this huge, uh, you know, enthusiasm for cars. You've, you've had different shows that you've been on. And yeah. Tell us yeah, about so it. Yeah, so uh, it goes back to what my dad said about figuring out what, you know, you love to do and find a way to make money. And so I've always loved cars. And uh, when I started doing well at the club, the first thing I did is I bought my dad a car, a uh, 64 Impala SS. It was very similar to the car he drove me home from the hospital in 1965 when I was born. Wow. So we go to car shows together. I surprised him with it. Uh, and then I started buying cars for myself. And I, I collect, I mean, I like everything, but I collect old Corvettes. That's kind of like my thing. And the guy that used to work on my car, a guy named Dave Weber, uh, honest, hardworking guy, shop was growing, and you know, I eventually became his partner in the shop. Um, and it's, you know, we got this cool shop. It's uh, out in Hicksville, Long Island called Dream Car Restorations. The website is uh, dreamcarrestorationsny.com. We've done some really neat work there. And I, speaking of Jerry, I've actually helped him get some cars awesome. for comedians and cars getting coffee. I got him the 63 split window coupe uh, for Obama. I got him the 56 
uh, Corvette that he used with uh, Jimmy Fallon. Um, so it's been fun, you know. And and how fun to be able to take that love and apply it to this world. Yeah. Yep. True. That's cool. It is cool. Yeah, I mean, and those those cars are works of art. Um, but it's interesting because the shop, through the shop, about four and a half years ago, I was showing one of my cars at a show, and uh, I went to get something to drink, and I came back, and there was a guy underneath my car looking at it. It was a, and the car I had there was a 71 Corvette Survivor, which means it was an original, unrestored car. That's what we call Survivor. So original paint, interior, um, chassis, original engines, original. So the guy pops out, and he goes, oh, is this your car? I said, yeah. And he said, to ask some questions. I said, okay, I have answers. So we went through it, and I asked, answered a bunch of questions. And then he started asking me questions about a 53 Corvette, which is the first year Corvette. They only made 300. They're very rare. There's probably only 140 or 50 left. 54 Corvette, a 55, which is another rare car. They only made 700. You know, there's probably only a few hundred of those left. Wow. And then he said a 56, and I said, hey, are you talking about the Peter Max collection? And his face dropped down to the ground. Now, the Peter Max collection, the artist Peter Max, bought 36 Corvettes from a guy who won them in a contest from VH1 in 1989. VH1 did a giveaway, because they were then a fledgling network, uh, and they were pitched this idea to uh, do a big contest giving away America's greatest sports car. You know. So long story short, they did the contest. This guy wins the cars. Has them for a short time, sells them to Peter Max. Peter Max has this big scan, uh, scheme that he's going to paint them and auction them off at Yankee Stadium. He never gets around to doing that. They sit in garages and moved around from garage to garage in Manhattan. These guys find them, and it was a cousin of the guy that was underneath my car. Long story short, they hire me to assess what the cars are. Dave and I go there. Greatest barn find in history. These 36 Corvettes covered in bird dew dust, flat tires, missing parts. We go in there, assess every single car, and I told them, this is what you have, this is the number you need to buy them at. And they did. So they gave the shop the job to restore the cars, and I said to them, they were just gonna take them, fix them, and flip them, either buy an auction or sell them. I said, you have a TV series here. You know, I said, so we should go pitch this. You know, so we, um, shopped it to a couple of production companies, but the one we decided on was a company called Bungalow Media here in New York, which is owned by a guy named Bobby Friedman, and talk about things coming full circle. Bobby Friedman was the executive at VH1 that greenlit that contest in 1989. He's a dear friend, I've known him forever. No coincidence there. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. So, you know, we partnered with Bobby and his guys, uh, a fantastic crew down there. And we go into History Channel and pitch the series, and they said, right in the room, we love it, you know, but we, we, we need like an interesting way to kind of tell the Corvette story. Is there, is, there, is there anything that has been told about Corvette before? I said, yeah, it's a small fact that most people don't know. They never made an 83 Corvette. You know, with the um, C3 generation, which lasts from 68 to 82, they, had, they wanted to make like a blockbuster car in 83, and they just didn't have time to complete the car. So they never made they one They never made year. one. Just came out as an 84. So I suggested, I said, look, why don't you let me design one? I have like a lot of old, old design sketches and Get out of print books, you know, and I'll have my shop build it. And they said, we love it. That'll be the special that launched the series. So I... Uh, called in some favors. I got Dave McClellan, who was the chief engineer of the Corvette program at that time, to come and sit with me. I shared my ideas with him, you know, and uh, we built this car in seven weeks and revealed to Dave McClellan, another engineer named Rick Darling, that was at GM at the time, and then Danny Coger from Counting Cars on History Channel. Oh yeah, sure, I know. Yeah, yeah Danny's a great guy. He's awesome. All great guys. Um, so yeah, this series is going to come out in uh, sometime in 2019 on History Channel. Did you record them, the the episodes yet, or one? Okay, it's just one episode. No, it's going to be. They oh, it'll be a 12. series. Okay. Yeah, yeah, twelve. Great. Yeah. You recorded one. Yeah. Wow, how exciting! Yeah. So, did you reveal this car yet anywhere? Not really. No one. No one is. Okay. No. 
can't wait to see it's this. It's in the garage. That is I can show you a picture when we're done. Okay, great. Yeah. Awesome. Wow. Well, this has been wonderful. We're, we're, we're up against some time restrictions right now. So... Um, yeah, I have two more minutes. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to squeeze as much in, as we can in two minutes. Mm -hmm. Where do you see yourself in this business going in the next three, five, ten years? Where, where, where can you take it? Yeah, well, we're doing a lot of TV production now. You know, we're doing this really cool series, uh, the first of its kind. It's the first stand-up series in virtual reality. So we partner with a company called NextVR, which are kind of like the cream of the crop in the VR world. They have exclusive license with the NBA and the NFL. Um, and then we're doing the series for Oculus and their VR portal. And Oculus is owned by Facebook. So we have great partners. And uh, they just ordered our third season. We start next Thursday. Uh, so there's a bunch more shows coming out. It's, it's, it's great technology. I mean, literally, camera sits in the middle of the room and you put these head, the, these this headset on and you think you're sitting in the middle of Gotham. It's in 31 countries. I mean, it's crazy. And the technology, I mean, it's freaky. Not only is the technology like you're sitting in the room, but you feel like you can reach out and grab the comedian. And did they develop it here? Were they in this room to develop it? Oh yeah, so basically they approached us about doing a series, because we had done another series for Mark Cuban and they saw that I on, saw his, that on yeah, yeah. Access TV. Right. Um, and that, was, that ran for quite a while. Yeah, right? We did 125 yeah. episodes, which yeah, is so, fantastic. Yeah. He was great to deal with. Cuban, I mean, no BS. Yeah, he's a great just, guy. We pitched yeah. the show. He liked it, ordered a pilot. The next day, we shot the pilot a month later, and then he ordered the series. It was just boom, 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 boom. You can see why a guy like that is successful. You sure. know? Makes he knows things what happen. he wants, and it just, there's no BS. Yeah. But this VR show, is, it, it's really cool. Wow. Unique thing. We'll have you to know? look so out I for think that. You know, I mean, the club is doing great. We're looking to expand in different ways, you know, here. I think more production, you know, that's the future. Awesome. Just kind of doing things that I like to do. So. That's great. Well, Chris, you're a class act. You're a oh, legend thanks. in the industry. Ah, it's thanks. a pleasure to meet you. One last question before I let you go. I ask every guest, what do you want your legacy to be? That's a difficult question. Yeah, I'd like to think that uh, somehow what we did here changed the comedy world. Keep doing what you're doing. Keep me making people laugh. Yeah, it's, it's, and, it's uh, fun. Yeah, it's, it's great to have you on the show, and welcome to the American Real family. Oh, thanks. I appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thanks for your time. Yep, appreciate thanks. it. Thanks for tuning in to American Real. Be sure to visit our website, AmericanReal.tv, or search for us on iTunes or YouTube for past episodes. While you're there, please rate us or leave us a review, as that helps others find our show. I am truly grateful and appreciate all of your support. At American Real, we're on a mission to help as many people around the world fulfill their dreams and obtain their goals. If you'd like to be part of our inner circle or want one-on-one -on -one coaching, Check out the American Real Learning Academy, where we have self-help groups and courses so you can build the best you. We also have a new Facebook group where you can connect with high achievers from around the world. If you want to go even further, maybe you're determined to write your own book or launch your own podcast, contact me today to see if we could help. You can reach me through Instagram or Facebook or email me directly at roger at americanreal.tv. And speaking of podcasting, our next course will be starting soon. So if you're interested in launching your own podcast, join me and podcast your passion. I'll take you through my eight week course where I'll mentor you to build a world-class podcast. I'm only taking on a small group of people who want to share their passion through broadcasting, where I'll have you up on iTunes and YouTube within weeks so you can podcast your passion. Click on the link below for more information. Thanks for tuning in and we'll see you next week.